layer of transparency and meekness. We're shocking. And there's something about that as men that we realize that meekness and self-control and being open in front of brothers, three different colors, right? It's like, it's like green, you're safe. Yellow, it's getting dangerous. Red, you're about to mess up. And then you start quantifying what actions did you have Good morning, listeners. Welcome to our next episode of our podcast. Today in studio, we have Gabriel Strijdom. Gabriel, it's so good to have you. Good to be here, Yaku. Um, maybe tell us a little bit of who you are and what you do for a living. Yes, thank you so much, guys. Such a joy to be with you. Yaku, thank you for having me. Um, Gabriel, Gabriel, um, Strijdom. Depends on if you're English or Afrikaans. People always ask me, which one do you like? I honestly don't mind. But um, I am a full-time missionary with Youth of the Mission, our base of Five Fragrance Base. Um, that just means we're like a household within the greater family. And I help lead a community of about 120 missionaries here in Portchester, from 11 different countries. We speak 16 languages and we do everything from um, prayer and worship. We have a prayer room that runs two hours every single day. Um, I'm sorry, Monday to Friday. We have big evangelism events. We have a CrossFit box that we use for discipleship and evangelism. We do training. We have a university and um, Bible translation, social media. Our heart really is to reach um, young South Africans with the good news of the gospel. And it's my privilege to be a part of a leadership team that helps direct some of this. Awesome. And you're married? Married. I have a beautiful wife called Michelle. She's amazing. And a uh, young little daughter, uh, 17 months old, Anastasia Zoe. Beautiful. Absolutely changed my life. Yaku warned me. <laughs> I, I, I believed him, but I didn't know. Mm. Right? I've, I've learned not to um, not believe Yaku. He's been right <laughs> in the past before. so A few times at least. <laughs> at least twice. <laughs> <laughs> These two big ones you were right about. So. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Gabe. Um, <clears throat> maybe let's start with a little bit about your story and where we met. Yes. yes. So fun. Um, well, I'll, I'll, I'll share a little bit maybe just how we met. Um, I think uh, we met when I was 16. Um, I was I went to this men's camp uh, called Camp David. And I was I was really training to be a pro athlete, a pro rugby player. And um, I, was, I had a very fast metabolism and I had a pretty strict eating and supplementation routine that I followed and I remember I came to this camp and Yaku wanted to take my supplements away from me um, to fast for a weekend and I almost got in a fight with Yaku um, <laughs> but God used it, it was pretty profound actually I went on this camp and changed my life pretty rap, uh, radically um, but the wild thing was Yaku asked me if I can trust Jesus that he would um, he would protect me for what he's called me to do and actually after that camp I got a full financial sponsorship to cover all of my sports supplementation and um, for the next i think it was about four or five years mm -hmm. and i really thought i in my heart it was like man yaku told me that if i trust god he will provide and god provided in a way that changed my life so and we I, met and i also think you you picked up like a kilogram or two yeah in I, that camp. yes i picked up a kilogram or two it was it was <clears> honestly <throat> very supernatural i have to say like there's there's god did something i also remember um is the first time that i met um young men that lived in sexual purity, and I honestly did not believe them. I remember the first time Yaku and one of the other leaders told me that they have not been in sexual compromise, like porn, masturbation, anything like that. I think it was like six years, and I remember I laughed at them. I was like, there's no way you're lying. Right? <laughs> I don't know any man your age that lives in purity. It is not doable. And as you remember earlier, I said there's two things that Yaku was right about that I didn't believe him. This is one of those things. And I'm so thankful because that started a journey in my life where I'm walking in sexual purity now that would I don't think I knew existed before I met you. And so that was a part of my story. So then Yaku started praying for me for the next seven years to get saved. And um, I was a pro athlete by the age of 19, walked away from the Lord in a pretty radical way, drugs, sex, rock and roll, lived a very, 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 very broken, distorted life. And um, on my then girlfriend, now wife's 21st birthday, I overdosed on cocaine, thought I was going to die. And um, I remember that uh, I had this deep kind of conversation with myself, like, I'm going to die and you're gone. 
and the only people I knew to go to was my parents, which I'm deeply thankful for. Like I know there's not a lot of people that can say that. Like if I'm at the bottom of my life, I go to my parents. I went to them. My father, my mother, um, led me to the Lord. My dad led me to Jesus in His room, 4:25 in the morning on the um, 26th of June, 2013. Threw up blood for 25 minutes after that, and didn't have any withdrawal. Which I don't know what to do with that. I honestly think God did some deliverance on me and did a miracle. And remember, um, I've gone to Yaku previous times. If you grew up in a in a in a nominal Christian environment, you get saved forty seven thousand times, right? And it's just because we don't understand lordship. It's usually just fire insurance. I remember after that time, I came to Yaku and said, "Yaku, I got saved." It's the first time they believed me. He's like, yep, I believe you're saying something like different. <laughs> something looks different. But remember that time when I got born again, what happened was, is that um, it was the first time where there wasn't a but or if. It was like fully like, God, I choose you. And you can have anything you want in my life. Like there's nothing that you cannot have. And um, my life dramatically changed. And um, Yako walked the road with me for a few months before I did my DTS in the US, the Subject Training School. Walked me through my inner healing season. I remember he prayed for me for inner healing and he had to tell his wife to pray with him to forget the stuff I told him because it was so intense. I was a very good sinner, a very successful pagan. Um, and I'm deeply thankful, Yaku. Like, honestly, I would not be the man I am today if it wasn't for you. Like, you kept on pursuing love and friendship and discipleship and I'm whole and I have a wife and a beautiful daughter because you kept fighting for it. So thank you so much. Come on, man. Praise the Lord that you're here, eh? Hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> and not changing other people. <laughs> Come on. Man, I'm so thankful. But that's just his faithfulness, mm -hmm. right? Amen. His faithfulness. Amen. <clears throat> so purity, we can definitely talk about that for a while. Um, so you came out of that life. Yes. You know, the sex part of the yes. sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Um, I remember you know, the, the sessions we had. <laughs> um, praise the Lord, not the detail. Yeah. But the sessions at Copper Cafe, mostly. Yes. In that inside room, the second yeah. room, I remember yeah. that. We prayed a lot there, goodness. But, um, <clears throat> I mean, then the journey, journey started. Yeah. It was tough, you know. This is, for most men, the biggest battle they'll face concerning yes. themselves. Yes. And finding themselves. Yes. Um, but, I mean, at least we can say we've seen people reach freedom. Oh, 100%. And live it out. Hundreds of people. Yeah. Not dozens. Hundreds of people. I, I would say I'm more convinced now that you can be fully free than I've ever been in my entire life. Like, I remember when we, so me and you started working on it. And let me maybe say this before I talk about this. I, like, I don't think people understand the importance of inner healing. And that James verse that says, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another and you will be healed. The importance of that part there. That healing there is not just physical healing. It's the healing of your soul. If you think in 1 Corinthians when he speaks about if you have sexual relationship with a prostitute, your soul kind of like mixes with her. Like it just talks about the internal destruction that sexual immorality does. You need to understand if you watch porn on a cell phone, your soul also gets split in the same way if you have sex with a person in that way. And then what happens is if we do not have a, a theology that encourages prayer ministry, inner healing, whatever you want to call it, bringing it into light, praying, confessing, a lot of men, it's like putting like a, 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 a plaster or what do you call it, band -aid. like a band-aid on an infected wound. Mm -hmm. And then when you're tired, you're overwhelmed, when you're stressed or you're hungry, this will manifest. What will manifest is the sickness of this broken soul. And I just think for me, it's like it was you and then one American leader I had that really walked the road with me. When it came to purities, when I did my DTS, and it had to fix a brokenness on the inside that that didn't have to do with porn or sex, right? It had to do with like I I I I I destroyed me. You break yourself in this, and so I just think like any man that's listening to this or woman, right? There might be some ladies listening to us in these freedom. I want to tell you that living in the light, free from shame, is the greatest tool to freedom. I would say that part, right? Living the life free of shame. And then the second thing is, is to know what are the things that pushes you into brokenness. So I, I would say like those things and then 
Like the triggers? Yeah, the triggers. What are the triggers, right? Like, so like uh, I had a guy once when we lived in the US, he, he gave his teaching. I had a, a group of like, I think 160 or 180 people go through this training on how to live in purity. He used to live, work with um, six and sex and sex and love anonymous is like AA for sex addicts. Oh, wow. Right. He destroyed his ministry by sex addiction. His wife left him and then he got whole and then he started working for them and how to help people get whole. So then I asked him, Hey, can you please come and talk to men in ministry and women in ministry on how to get purity? And one of the things he mentioned is this thing. It's like, you get like three different colors, right? It's like, it's like green, you're safe. Yellow, it's getting dangerous, and red, you're about to mess up. And then you start quantifying what actions lead you to which one. And you write it down, and the people in your life that your accountability know that. And they can ask you about your green zone, your yellow zone, your red zone. That's good. Right? And so that would, what that means is you can't hide. So if my red zone is that, like, my Discover page on my Instagram has tons of ladies with not a lot of clothes on it, Right, you can take my Instagram, look at my Discover page to know where my heart is at. So it just makes it impossible for you to hide. And a lot of times discipleship in that way, for some people, what I'm saying right now, Sam, is deeply extreme. But I would say it's like, it's only as extreme as you, I would say this, to those who are lukewarm, people who are radically in love will always look like legalistic. Hmm. Right? Same in marriage, right? Being because of the seriousness of their intent. Oh, because love is like zealous. <clears throat> love is not <throat> reserved. Love is fully given. And so when I'm fully in love with Jesus, and now in mine, your lives, there's something added to this. We're fully in love with our wives, and we fully love our children. Now the level of accountability that's in my life looks legalistic because there's no movement. There's no wiggle room. Because, because of the consequences. Because of the consequences destroys, in my case, like not just me and Michelle and the daughter, the hundred and something people I lead, the thousands of people that their lives are impacting, it then touches all of them. I once heard somebody say there's a very famous pastor in an American city, and his main worship leader said, if my pastor will have a moral failure, our city's economy will suffer because of how many tens of thousands of people come to their city for their church. And we need to understand sometimes that we're not just thinking about, oh, I'm watching porn masturbating, da 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 it's my little secret thing. No, 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 there's, there's hundreds of people potentially in your life that will be impacted by this. And our, our conscious effort to be transformed by the renewing of our mind does not come by a lone ranger. It comes from people living in deep community. Kind of like Yaku, like you have full access. You can ask me any question you want. Right? Like a guy I walk with that asks me the hardest questions consistently is Scott Graham. Scott always asks me, how's it with you and your wife? Right? How's your, how's your marriage? How's, how's your intimacy? Like, how are you doing with purity? Like, you travel a lot. Right? Has there been anything that's triggered you on your travel? Like, he's just like vicious in question asking. And I feel so safe around. Yeah, you welcome it. Oh, I love it. I was like, buddy, I feel so loved with you. Thank you. And I think sometimes we're afraid of it because what happens if we then do get triggered? Do we then hide it? No, 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 no. Then I go like, I know he's the first, but I'm calling Scott right now. Right? Because there's trust that's been established that we're fighting for the same thing. So I think that the impurity of that conversation for me, like... I'm now surprised, honestly, if I think about some of the men that we walk with our staff, I'm surprised if they struggle with sexual sin. Because we've had so much victory and freedom that I'm like, and we have people, the guys that come from deep homosexual, do not know how many sexual partners they've had in their lives. Literally cannot count the number. That now go like five, six, seven, eight years, I've not had one sexual thing happen. Like I am so convinced, like people that's been raped by multiple people, that had real, not just soul wounding in the sexual area, but there's some real demonic influence mixed in there. That got freedom, got deliverance. Sin walking, has families, is married with children, not struggling at all. Doesn't mean not getting tempted, but there's a difference between temptation and struggle. Yep. Temptation is like 
somebody walks past me with inappropriate amount of clothing and I see and I look away and my mind is not tempted to run four billion miles in the wrong direction. It's just no stop. Mm. So I just, I'm convinced that this thing is such a, a, a possibility that sometimes nobody just tells us you can be free. Mm. You're like, you're a man, you're going to struggle. The biggest thing that ever happened to me, and please interrupt you, but the biggest thing that ever wrong advice a leader gave me, I just got saved and I went to a leader <clears throat> and I told him, Hey, I come from this background. I'm struggling with porn, masturbation. How do I get free? It's like 11 years ago. And this guy goes like, well, don't watch porn. And if you masturbate, just, just don't think about anything wrong. And it's okay. And it was probably the most destructive piece of advice anybody ever gave me. Because as a young guy who didn't know better, right? I wasn't saved then. It was just before I got saved. Because that person was a leader, I thought it was the word of God. Mm. And I just want to say, anybody listening here, there is no place where selfish pleasure is the will of God. Pleasure is never meant to be selfish. It's meant to be in service of covenant love. Mm. That's so good. So, of course, we're touching on some some sensitive subjects today but i think it's necessary i mean i, I think we we talk about these things way no not of, not often enough no um because people struggle more than, than we think yes i agree and the, the downward slope of these especially porn you know i mean um kids porn and all those things are real it's very real. and it doesn't stop there yeah if you have enough of that you want that yeah. yeah that's that's the reality of it yeah so <clears throat> Maybe the baseline, it is possible to be free. Yes, end of conversation. <laughs> end of conversation. Thank you, Jesus. And I would say, Yaku, like, whoever is listening, like, the importance of their understanding that you need to get convinced of that. Mm. Before you jump to, okay, how do I get free? No, no, no. Spend, like, two or three weeks prayer, fasting, seeking the word, getting convinced that you can be mm. free. And freedom means, freedom does not mean not temptation. Freedom means you're not tormented consistently right and that you can joyfully say no hmm. freedom also means that your body doesn't consistently want it right because you have not trained the neural pathways in your mind hmm. to be hungry for something you've untrained its hunger that's good because that's an important one because hmm. a lot of times they're like oh well i can't help my yeah it's because you've trained your body to want this and if you specifically i think it's important if you take this to being a man, um, I'd say temptation is a call to battle. Yes. Because it is something you're going to have to fight. Yeah, consistently. Consistently. Just yeah. don't fight it alone. Yeah, ever. I mean, it's like it's like life insurance. <clears throat> you can't get it when, it when you need it. Yes. You have to get it beforehand. Way beforehand. That's why we need community. <laughs> Brotherhood. Yes. We establish it beforehand. Yes. Work on a culture of um, confessing. That's what we yes. do at Camp David. We have this culture. Yeah. Of confessing, being transparent, being vulnerable. Yeah. Vulnerability is not weakness. No. Being vulnerability vulnerable. is strength. Yes. Right? Jesus is the only God who is vulnerable. <clears throat> Nobody in the Judeo, uh, in, in the time of Jesus, would have been surprised if a God was powerful. Because mm. all gods were powerful. That level of transparency and meekness mm. was shocking. And there's something about that as men that we realize that meekness and self control. And being open in front of brothers, that brotherhood, mm. that is a, a secret superpower mm. that very few men ever tap into. Because they think to be untouchable is to be strong. Mm. It's actually not just shows your insecure little young boy who never knew love. Mm. And you'll treat your family the same way, which is a great injustice to them. Absolutely. And somewhere, somewhere it will crash. Always. And you'll have nothing left. Yes. And that's probably why... So many men try or, uh, or commit suicide these yeah. days. Yeah, because they just can't hit the, the standard. It's impossible. Mm -hmm. And on the one side, the standard is like you have to be this perfect, macho, male, bravado culture. And the other side is like if you're a man, you're the scum of the earth. Mm -hmm. So you can never, like if you're more man, you're, too, you're, you're, you're never man enough. If you're less man, you're still a man, so you're still an oppressor. Mm -hmm. 
So there's nowhere where you win because you're just evil or not good enough. There's a part of the scheme of the enemy to like crush manhood, which I think is demonic. So where, the, where does that leave us? You know, practically, what should we do? If that's the truth. Yeah. And it sounds like we're stuck in this ditch. <clears throat> yes. Where does that leave us? I, I think I think practical things to do is find two other men and just lead out in radical transparency and don't jump to two other ones. And together yes. be different. The, together don't be try different. this alone. Yeah, never. Yeah. Because if you do it alone, it's impossible. Like It is literally impossible. Find two other guys. Be radical, transparent, be weak, or like this mind security. I dare some of you guys, especially like all, all the engineers out there and the guys that like have quote unquote made the success in your early 30s, like you've done it. Go to one of your Christian friends and just tell him your greatest insecurities. Can say, can you pray with me? I want victory. I promise you a friend will not know what to do because they've probably never seen another man. Mm-hmm. Right? Saying, don't tell him you're struggling with porn. You can, but that's not hard anymore because male culture, if you're a Christian, and some measure of like discipleship culture, we've been taught how to share sex- sexual brokenness. Mm. But we've never been taught how to share insecurities. We've never been taught how to share like, I'm afraid I'm gonna neglect my family. I'm afraid I'm gonna da 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 da. And that part there is what breaks you out of the ditch. Because then you're not the oppressive man that's angry all the time because you're not good enough. And you become more manly mm. because you realize you find fulfillment in the identity of Christ. And not some quote unquote, do I shoot enough guns? Do I bench press enough? Do I run enough? Do I like drive the nicest car? There's not vanity metrics, mm. right? It's two content of a heart that reveal the man. It's now, do I love guns? Heck yes. Do I love gym? Heck yes. Like I love all those things, but it doesn't make me a man. Mm. What makes me a man is that the father made me one and he accepts me. And that close knit community of guys where we can be fully open. Mm releases that true identity Jesus made us to be in a way where we're not oppressed between two extremes. That's cool. I mean, if I think back, <clears throat> that's where this journey in, in Camp David, but even before that, yeah. but this brotherhood thing started for me. Yeah. Now I met Andrew, <clears throat> my best friend, and yes. back then Fricky. And we got together, we just started playing computer games, you know, Need mm-hmm. for Speed. <laughs> EA Sport, it's in yeah, the game, in you know? the game. Started playing that, and then one night, um, I can't even remember if, if I, which who it was, but one of us said, "Guys, I'm I'm tired of struggling with these things." And we just laid it out. Come on. People like, uh, uh, me too, and me too, and we just started talking about these things. Come on. And at least we knew Jesus back then. <laughs> started praying about these things, and then it started. Amen. And we just built on that, and today. It's a culture we're trying to, you know, all we've been trying for years to establish it in um, um, manly communities. Yeah. And Yoko, I think you said something very important. And I think this is something we sometimes get wrong. I, I have not seen a lot of men be good in transparency when we have a coffee and look at each other. But when we play some Xbox or go do a hard workout or, Relax or go work together, like build something mm-hmm. and then we start talking. It's like it opens up our hearts. Like the other day, we were a group of guys who played some Xbox, played some Madden and FIFA together. We had a little tournament. And like we're playing and guys are like talking about their marriages. Like, man, I need to figure out how to love my wife better. Da, 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 da. And I was like, man, it's so funny. Because you could not get those guys in a coffee to have that conversation. Yeah. But we're like kind of a little bit competing, a little bit like in a, in a relaxed zone in hearts. That's like with 1040 CrossFit, our CrossFit guys here. Like you do the hardest crossfit workout in your entire life. You're laying on the ground, dry heaving, want to throw up. And then you go like, what do you think God in your heart? And you're like so tired, but like it's your, your, your walls are down. And it just opens you up in a way. So I so agree. I think like that, a part of this is important as men is to go like, we function well in authentic relationship. Not necessarily in scheduled things all the time. Right now, you can schedule fun things, but it's like the fun competitiveness. I don't know how to even communicate it effectively, but the fun competitiveness makes a man's heart open up a little bit. It's almost like you, you, the the okay, the, the pretense you did. Yeah, you, you did it go. go. Yeah, and it can be different things, right? It can be Xbox or it can be like CrossFit. It doesn't, chopping wood or whatever. Yeah, it, it doesn't have to be always like 
some highly masculine expression of whatever like Tom Cruise showed us. Which right? means it can be painting. Yeah, like it can literally it be, be anything. It can be arts that good. Like we do things together, and it just it, it just opens up men's hearts. So I'm like, I think that it's such a good point that to make because I've just seen most guys that I walk around with, I try not to anymore do a coffee when we're going to have great conversations. Go for a run after the run, sit on a hill somewhere, have a conversation. Like it's just go like I don't just want to like sit down and have like a meeting and now we're going to talk about horrible things. That sounds horrible. Yeah, it does. It sounds <laughs> terrible. Right? Yeah. I think there's something out of the relational part that's super important. And just in general in life with people, but I think with men specifically there's something there. That's good. That's good. So it's possible, baseline. Yes. Um, once you've thought about that and realized that, where you go from there? <clears throat> I would say... You look at these two friends, go like find those two friends. So baseline is possible. Second place is who's two friends I can deeply trust. Hmm. Don't jump from person to person, right? It just n never helps you. Rather go and tell the same guy 15 times you're wrong, hmm. right? I would say that's the next part and then do what we talked about. Go for a hard workout, play some Xbox, confess your sins to each other hmm. and pray, right? And I think just to just insert, um, the reason that it's hard makes it better. Way better. Way better. Yeah. If it wasn't hard, I mean, hardship almost fuels change. Yes. Okay. Totally does. And it does in, in, in psychology. You do hard things with appropriate reward. Your brain releases dopamine, which creates neuroplasticity, which literally means the pathways in your brain changes. You don't get rewarded for easy things. Your brain literally rewards you for hard things. So when we do hard things, we change. So it's just, that's not even Christian, it's just anatomy, right? So which means this battle, this journey will be hard. Yes. But it's good. It's very good. But it's hard. If it's not hard, you should be concerned, right? You either have self-discipline or life will discipline you, hmm. right? And the one you pay when you don't want to, and the other one you pay when you want to. It just depends on which one you choose. So I would say, so it's a revelation that can happen. I would say, again, baseline, you need to make sure public, do you agree with this? Go read Titus. Talks about grace teaches us to say no to ungodliness in this present age. Right? You cannot get around that. Right? It's like kind of, yeah. Second Peter 1 from verse 4 talks about it as well. Talks about make every effort. Right? So you have to make every effort. Grace teaches you to say no. Romans 6 talks about, well, I keep on sinning because of grace. He says, by no means, how can a dead man keep doing things that sinful people did? Right? Um, you can look at um, Romans 12. It talks about give the life as a living sacrifice. Um, and doing and knowing and doing God's, like what's pleasing and perfect to him. But I would say that you need to, like Galatians is actually good. I think it's Galatians 5. It says, so is, he will reap whatever he sows in the flesh. He will reap in the flesh whatever he sows, but he will reap in the spirit. I would say get like a, a, a armory of Bible verses in this first basic phase of I can overcome and just have them consistently in your mind that whenever temptation comes or somebody gives a stupid argument, you can't be free from sin um, or free from sexual sin is you just can go like, no, well, the Bible says this is this. Sorry, like I, this is my authority. And then again, bring that to friends. You and your friends hold each other accountable. Maybe you guys find a few really powerful verses you can meditate on. Like prophesy, pray that over each other, lay hands on each other. Then I would say probably the next part is is to then work hard on finding with those three guys. And this is again three guys you deeply trust. I would say find those circles of temptation, green, yellow, red. Right? And and then depends on how transparent people want to be. But this is what I've told guys that I walk a really close road with. Whenever they come to me and go like, Man, I watch porn, I go like, Okay, great, what do you watch? And then why that? Hmm. And yeah. then work backwards. Work backwards. So then if you work backwards from there, it helps you to realize like, man, there are certain things that have probably influenced how you would see that. And then you just pray and break through that. Hmm. Also, if you've just seen with guys specifically, sometimes you just need a good, healthy fear of the Lord. Some of this. Hmm. And when guys know, you're going to ask them, what do they do? Like I've had multiple guys tell me that's probably the, one of the biggest things that made me not do it. 
<laughs> because there's a there's a part of like, man, I just this is scary. Like he's gonna ask me, right? And so then that level of commitment between those three three people becomes a safe haven. And if you have those three two friends, a group of three, what I would say then is that you make a commitment to each other. Specifically, again, remember we're talking freedom. Go like you can call me whenever you want. Like if your phone is on, um, do not disturb. Their number can come through. You call me one a.m. in the morning. Like I'm committed that we'll get free. That's it in a conversation. Mm -hmm. So I would say like that. That kind of was the initial two parts that I really, really go after. Um, and some of us, this is other part, and you have to please jump in on this one. But some of us might need to go counseling. Specifically, if there's a history of deep abuse, and it's healthy, it's so needed. Like there's nothing wrong with counseling, right? Some of us legitimately might need some deliverance, right? Because there's something of the work of the enemy and oppressive spirits that really does impact us in sexual immorality. And sometimes we just need somebody to help us get free from those evil influences, and. A lot of the things I'm saying right now, people go like, this is deeply intense. But it's only as intense as you want to stay married and raise healthy children. And or have a good marriage one day. Yeah, or have a good marriage one day. Or There's a lot of implications to this. But I think any man who has been in bondage and is fully free will tell you it's worth it. I've never met one man that said it was not worth it. No. They wish they were still lived in their old life. I've never not met one. I don't know about you. No. Me neither. I mean, someone longed for those things every now and then, but freedom is more than double better. <laughs> oh, it's a zillion times better. Just because of the better. shame, you know. Yeah. Shame says, I am the mistake. Yeah. And, I'm a mistake. And when you live it deeply and just thinking about my life, I lived, it, lived a very broken life when it comes to this stuff. Like you become something evil. And I think that like, I don't know, I could have whatever I want at that time. You can put a gun to my head, fortunately, to do it again. Like the level of internal brokenness has to come on you. It's mm. not worth it. Mm. That's good. So maybe just to put some context on God's heart in this as well. Yes. He wants more than you, that you be free. Oh, way more. So he's just waiting for you to make that, 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 that shift. Yes. You know? And I, and I think that like God is not just even waiting. He initiated the shift by dying on the cross. Because mm. like I got beaten and destroyed so that you don't have to be. Right? So he initiated and then he descended into heaven and the Father and Son sent the Spirit. And he has the Spirit of freedom, Holy Spirit. Right? So it's not just that God is a passive position waiting for us to want freedom. It's like I did everything in the universe for you to live in full freedom, to live on the offense. We're not living on the defense, mm. right? Live consistently, intentionally aware of freedom. So then when Paul says everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial, I will not be mastered by anything. That's one of my favorite Bible verses in the whole world. Mm. I will not be mastered by anything. A lot of times when I'm talking to students, and this might be a bit blunt, but it's true. I said, I just have a bowing problem. I just don't like to bow to things, mm. right? It might be a little bit of a rebellious streak in me, but the only thing I want to bow to is God. And some of you bow to your palms more than you bow to anything else. You're so arrogant, strong, mm. you can lift all the weights in the world. You're the boss of your work, but you can't say no to your hand. Wow. And that should go like, man, I'm like, wow, I'm, I'm not as big as I think I am. That I might be why you're so aggressive the whole time. I don't want to be like that. Never. I don't want to be that guy. I want to go like, no. Right? I bow before one thing. His name is Jesus. I mean, godly masculinity looks different than what the world says. You know? Way different. And that is different. That's way different. Way different. Yeah. And uh, also it makes more sense in my brain, to be honest. Of course. <laughs> and, and I Rationally. You, I bet you that when guys make that decision and start living that different, others will follow. Yeah. Like It's like a, a crew of guys are just waiting for someone to take the lead. Yeah. And it's easy for them. When somebody takes the lead, most of the times it's just easy. Like, boom, let's go. Yeah, okay, let's go for it. So passivity kills. Yeah. 
So I think that like passivity in that way is a part of the dangers. I think God's heart for that is total freedom revealed in the cross. It's also revealed in the New Testament writings on how many of the New Testament writers speak about the ability to be free from willful sin. Which means we can totally be free from any sin that tempts us. Sorry, I don't think it's anything necessarily to do with like ignorance. We will never stop being ignorant. Like we're not perfect in knowledge. God is the only perfect one. But I do believe the Holy Spirit and the blood of Jesus enables us and empowers us to work out our salvation of fear and trembling, to not have the need to say yes. I don't have to bow to anything but Jesus. I don't have to. I can. So that's why people always ask, why do you keep sinning after you're saved? It's like, well, because like Adam and Eve didn't have any sin, but they still had the ability to sin. They could choose against God, so you're born again. Right? You've been made a son, a saint. Right? And before God, you're righteous, holy, and blameless. And it doesn't mean now that because of that, you cannot sin. It just means you can choose for the first time not to sin. Before that, you could not choose not to be a sinner. Now you have the choice because of the blood of Jesus. And I think all of these things together really does communicate God's heart, not just for us to go like, oh, I wish I could be free one day. To go like, no, no, my intention was for you to with fear and trembling, work out what was worked into you. That's why it says work out your salvation, fear and trembling. Something was put in you when you got saved. And throughout our whole born again life, we work out this thing bit by bit, and we become more and more like Jesus. It's a transformation. Yes. It yep. has to be. It has to be. Not conforming, but transforming. Transforming. Yep. John Wesley says holiness is the essence of Christian life. That's good. I love it. So do you think we should gauge the expectation towards guys that maybe wants to you know, make this decision and starting this journey? The expectation is not that once you make this decision, you're going to be free immediately. No. No, The expectation no. is that you probably, probably are going to make some mistakes along the way. Yes. It's a journey. Yes. It's a journey, and I think that God is the kindest being in the universe. And He is right next to you every time you make a stupid mistake. And He sees it, and He still loves you. And meditating on God's love in the midst of our weakness will change you more than feeling guilty about it. Right? And the, re- the, 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 the I will usually tell young guys I walk with, if they go like, hey, I messed up, I say, okay, go lock your room. Go lock yourself in your room. And pray until you believe God loves you again. And then you can come and talk to me again. Because I've just realized it, 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 is, it is legitimately an unhealthy cycle if they first come to me to find love. Mm. So now go find love with Jesus mm. and then we'll have a follow-up conversation. Love and acceptance. Yeah. So it, it will probably take a while for some guys. I know some guys that had like one touch and gone. It's like they chose one day. I have one friend. So in church one day, somebody spoke about deliverance. Laid his hand on his house, hands on himself. says, I cast out any demon of lust that's in my life. I will never struggle with this again. Say so literally felt something lifted off him. Never struggle again. I don't even know how to do that. That was not yeah. my story. That's that was amazing. A, that was phenomenal. I wish all of all of the guys can go through yeah. that. <laughs> but I also know friends who had some that decided to be free and that they would go for counseling. It was years. Mm. But they're free now. Mm. But it was literal years of consistently going like, I will be free. Mm. If you're not, this will be an uphill battle mm. that you'll struggle with. So maybe to wrap up with um, Gab, I think this was a great, great discussion. We will definitely follow this up with more practical and um, word-based um, um, discussions. Yes. Um, so look out for that one. And if you've never heard about Camp David, we do men's camps. We have men's groups. Um, join us. We have a next camp the 15th of September. Yes, join them. It changed um, your life. In Potsdam before that, <clears throat> in Perl as well. After that, in Stoffberg, we put more longer as well. But um, look at our website, um, Instagram, Facebook, all those platforms we are on there. And join us. Mission, our mission, to get guys to Jesus and to get guys to be Jesus type of men. Amen. Thanks, guys. It was fun. Thanks, Shocky. So much fun. Guys, go do the camps. Let me end with this. There was a season here in Poch where I looked at all of the student leadership and I could not find one guy who has not been touched by Camp David. I just think the impact that Camp David has had in our city has been phenomenal. So if you've not been on one, you want to figure out what does it mean to be a Jesus type of guy? Come join them. It'll be fun. Bless you guys.